Hi, class. Uh, welcome to week 11 meeting. Let's see who is here. Rose is here, Magali, Masha, and uh, Sohel. So very good. You guys are here early. Um, now, uh, I'm very proud of myself because last night I have updated all your extra credits on exam two and also your discussion grade are now up to date. So if you check your discussion grade, this should be graded up to week 10. Um, and then for the uh, extra credit on the exam too. Um, now do this from check both places. So check both the mind tab uh, exam two grade and also check your um, exam two grade on, on your canvas. Because what I realized sometimes what it happens is that um, once I update a grade in uh, mind tab, uh, the canvas is slow to update. So check on it, make sure that eventually the grade, the extra credit is in there. Uh, and if you're not sure how many extra credit you get exactly, go into mind tab and then check on exam two grade. And then right below the grade, it has a little comment section. It tells you how many points you got for each week. Okay. And remember, every time you're checking here um, live, there's three points. And then if you're checking, um, I mean, if you watch the, the, the video in the recorded session, uh, that's two point extra, but make sure to put your name in the comment section. That's, that's how I know you got you 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 are here watching the video. Um, let me see, Muhammad's here. Uh, oh, Muhammad, uh, do me a favor. Send me an email. Let me know what's your uh, what's what is the course number for your class? Um, because what I realized that for my two classes, I have two Muhammad L. Kadir, all the same name. <laughs> so. So let me know. Uh, let me know what's your session number so I can sign you the exam to extra credit grade. Okay. All right. So uh, this week we're going to cover two chapters, and then uh, just like before, guys, if you have any questions, uh, put your comments in the chat box, and then let's uh, get it started now. Okay. All right. Screen sharing. All right, so chapter 15 talk about unemployment. Now, unemployment, we all heard it before. You know, this is just anybody who doesn't have a job. Uh, but unemployment economics is very specifically defined. So let's look at the definitions first. Um, so first, we need to know what's a labor force. Now, labor force, you know, so in America and anywhere, labor force defined as anybody who is able and willing to work. So be more specifically, labor force is for all the adult population who is over age 16 years older. And then to find our unemployment rate um, in charge is this agency called BLS, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And then their job in the economy is to, to survey, to find out all the data in the economy. So if you if you guys ever have a chance to go to the BLS website, uh, they have data collection on all kinds of stuff. So imagine uh, the price index for food, price index for, I mean, it's specific, specific item of food like cereals, um, rice, spaghettis, uh, noodles. So all kind of items in the in the price index. Also like your transportation costs. So anything you spend money on, BLS take uh, take, take information on that. And another thing BLS does is also collecting our unemployment numbers. And then what they will do, um, they will conduct weekly surveys, surveys. And this survey will be, they're gonna survey 60,000 households. So, um, when they call the household, they will ask them two questions. So whoever answered the phone, they will ask them, you know, sir or ma'am, did you work last week? If you says yes, that you worked last week, then you are employed. Now, if you says no, I didn't work last week, then they don't have a second question for you. So the second question is that if you didn't work last week, did you look for a job last week? If you says, you know, yes, I, I wasn't working last week, but I did look for a job, then you are unemployed. Um, now, however, that if you are if you are saying that oh um, I wasn't working last week and I didn't look for a job any uh, I didn't look for a job at all, then you are become a part of the economy that's not even in the labor force. So you're not even unemployed anymore. So to be so, so to be called unemployed, you have to be both um, working. I mean, both both not working and actively looking for a job. Oh hey. Kim, I got you, don't worry. All right, um, so three categories. So employed is anybody who is um, paid employee or self-employed, and this part is very important, 
any unpaid working in a family business, even though you're not getting paid, um, you know, in monetary terms, but you are still, you know, working for your family. So you are still employed. Now, unemployed is anybody who is not working, but is also actively looking for a job for the last four weeks. That's called unemployed. And then for anybody who is not working and not looking for a job, we call them not in the labor force. So they're not even part of labor force. So for our labor force, it's the total between employed plus unemployed, that is your labor force, okay? Now our unemployment rate is going to be your number of people who is unemployed divided by labor force times 100. That's your unemployment rate. So unemployment rate is always a percentage. That's already times 100. Okay. Uh, so that's unemployment rate. And then labor force participation rate, uh, we're going to take our labor force divided by the adult population. Uh, so how many people in America? And then therefore, this number is also percentage that shows you how much uh, what's the percentage of your um, population that's currently in the labor force? So those who are either working or looking for a job right now. So now suppose we have this question over here. Um, we have our number of people who is employed, number who is not employed, and a number who is not in labor force. We can use to find out what is our labor force participation rate, unemployment rate, okay? And then adult population and then labor force participation rate. Now, to find your um, your labor force is your employed plus unemployed. This is your labor force. So uh, labor force uh, is going to be one hundred forty four point three plus eleven point three. So this is one hundred fifty five point six. So that's your labor force. And then your unemployment rate uh, is going to be your unemployed divided by labor force. So unemployed is 11.3. Labor force is 155.6. So in a percentage, um, let's see what this answer is. So 11.3. Divided by 155.6, it's going to be about 7.3 percent. Okay, and then your adult population is everybody all together. That's your adult population. So 155.6 plus 90.6, it's going to be. So this is 246.2, and the labor force participation rate. Just use your labor force 155.6. Divided by population 246.2. So 155.6 divided by 246.2. It's going to be about 63%. Okay, so that's how you do this problem over here. All right, let me see. Rose, you have a question. Do you have any help assignment for this week? Um, Rose, I don't know if I have any actual uh, actual videos on this chapter, um, but how about this? Once we finish the lecture, then we go. Then we look at the um, the mind tab, and then see which question you guys have uh, have need some help on. Okay. All right. Um, so here's the numbers here. Um, it shows you the labor force participation rate and unemployment rate among different uh, subcategory of the economy. So uh, white males unemployment rates, but now this is 2013, so it's three years ago. So white males 6.1 percent, uh, white females 5.5 percent, uh, black males 14 percent, black females 10 percent. So uh, overall, uh, minorities does have a higher unemployment rate compared to the general population, okay? Uh, so keep in mind, then education is a very important factor for, uh, for unemployment rate. So the higher the education level, the lower the unemployment rate, and also the higher the labor force participation rate. So for 2013, if you look at anybody who has less than a high school diploma, the, high, the uh, unemployment rate is at 10.3%, and then also labor force participation rate is only 44%. So those with very little, little degree, they tend not to be working, and they tend not even being part of the economy. Now, on the other side, if you look at people with bachelor degree or higher, 
the unemployment rate is only 3.7%, so it's very, very low. And the participation rate is 75.3%. So it's very high participation rate, so it tends to be part of the economy. And then the, the unemployment is very, very low. So a, a good way to get to make sure you, you, you're you very employable is to have a very high degree, okay? Now this chart over here shows you the, the labor force participation rate by sex. Now it shows from 1950 to 2012. If you notice, in 1950, the gap between female and male is very, very high. So in 1950s, the female participation rate is about 33%, and then the male participation rate is about 87%. Now, and this, the reason why it's so low back then for females, because back in the old days, um, it was a norm for many um, of the females when they're uh, not married, they're working. But the moment they're married, they're gonna be staying at home, take care of the families. So they, they are no longer in the labor force. So that's why the, the, the participation is very, very low. But um, as time goes on, you know, the uh, more and more female going into the marketplace. And then the since our economy is changing, so many of the good manufacturer jobs are not here anymore. So many of the male dominated industries, they're all moving overseas. So those jobs are going away. That's why the, the male participation rate has been going down. So for the last uh, 50 years or so, has been converging. So this, get, this gap is getting smaller and smaller. And then if you notice that this deep over here, so you notice that for both male and female, the, the rate has been going down for the last five or six years. Um, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, one of the most important reasons is that uh, economy wasn't doing so good. So when economy was going down, uh, many people couldn't find a job anymore. So that's why they don't, um, when they stop looking for a job, they are no longer in the labor force. So that's why that's one reason why the number is going down. And the second reason why the number is going down, and it's gonna be a long-term trend, is that um, our the generation of baby boomers, uh, they're now enter into retirement ages. So a big portion of our economy is going into retirement. That's why the overall participation rate has been going down for both sexes. Okay. Um, all right, so let's keep going. All right, now what's a discouraged worker? So a discouraged worker is anybody who likes to work, but uh, giving up looking for a job. So whenever you have a discouraged workers, this will distort your, your unemployment rate. Now unemployment rate normally, if you think about it, unemployment rate, when the rate is lower, that means it's good. That means more people having jobs and less people looking for a job. And then when the rate is higher, that means bad. That means more people looking for a job. Um, but when you have discouraged worker, um, the direction of the economy actually is actually reversed compared to unemployment rate. Um, now let's see how this works. So suppose we have an economy that for this economy we have, uh, let's say 10 people. Uh, let me open my one note. All right, so population of 10. Now let's suppose we have um, working of eight people. So eight people working and then looking for a job, we're gonna have two people looking for a job. So for this economy, our unemployment rate, it's gonna be the number of people look, looking for a job. So two people divided by those who are working plus those who are looking for a job. So this is a 20% unemployment rate. Now let's suppose for these two people here, one of them uh, has been looking for a job for the last two years, but he couldn't find anything. And then, you know, next morning he decided, why even try? Let me stop doing this now and stop looking for a job and just stay home, take care of my family. So the moment this person stop looking for a job, then this picture will change. So once that happens, uh, we still have working, which is eight people working. And then we only have one person who is left looking for a job. And then one person who is not even looking for a job. Now remember, if you're not looking for a job, you are not even unemployed. You're just not even part of labor force. So for our new unemployment rate is one person looking for a job divided by eight people working 
plus one person looking. So this is one over nine, which is about 11%. So if you look at this comparison over here, so before it was 20% and now it's 11%. So does this 11% mean the economy is getting better? Not really, because you still have just two, eight people who is working. And then this actually means pretty bad because you have this one person who is giving up looking for a job. So what, in this case over here, when the unemployment rate goes down, it's actually a bad sign for the economy because we have more people who's, who's becoming discouraged worker. So this is what discouraged worker is, is anybody who gave up looking for a job and then that's gonna be bad for the economy. Now it does lower your unemployment rate, but it doesn't do anything good for the economy, okay? All right, so let's keep going. Now, there are four types of unemployment rate. Um, now, it depends on different text that you have. And then now, for our for our PowerPoint, only shows three, but there's one more. So let me tell you the four kind of unemployment rate. The first one is called cyclical unemployment. So cyclical unemployment is any unemployment that's dealing with business cycle. Now, um, business cycle is like your four seasons. Um, so we have you know expansions when the economy is doing good, or contraction when the economy is doing bad. So anytime the economy goes through you know recessions, depressions, contractions, the economy slows down. More people become unemployed, and then that is called a cyclical unemployment. So it's dealing with our business cycle when the economy is doing good, cyclical unemployment is low. When the economy is doing bad, cyclical unemployment is very very high. And then for the last recession back in 2010, at the height of our recession, our unemployment rate for the nation was at 10.6%. Now today it's just barely above 5%. So the reason why back then so high was because of the cyclical unemployment. And this one is the most important unemployment study. Okay. Um, actually that shows over here. See this, see this peak over here? So this increased unemployment rate, so back in 07, it was, bar was barely above 4%, but by 2010, it was breaking 10% rate. So this huge increase, that was the 2008 recession. All right, next is a frictional unemployment rate. So frictional unemployment rate. Oh, oh, hey, Reginald, you're here today. <laughs> All right, so the frictional unemployment rate, uh, is for anybody who is currently in between jobs. Now, for for the entire the economy is very big, and you have all kinds of people working in the economy. At any given time, there's always somebody who is currently in between jobs. You know, this is all because of your personal reasons. So suppose you think that your job is too far from your house, that, so you're gonna quit and then find a new job close to your home, or you don't like your coworkers, or you don't like your manager, you're gonna quit your job. So for anybody who is who is not working due to the personal reasons, we we'll call this one frictional unemployment, okay? Um, next one is called structural unemployment. So for structural unemployment, it's anytime there is a mismatch between the qualification of the worker and then the requirement of the position. So imagine that we have, uh, let's say we have currently opening for 10 doctors. At the same time, we have 10 engineers looking for a job. Well, 10 for 10, right? But they wouldn't work because the qualification of the of the engineers, they don't qualify for the requirement of being a doctor. So that's called a structural unemployment. Now, there is one more you guys need to probably notice on the test. It's called a seasonal, seasonal unemployment. So for seasonal unemployment, is any job, anybody's job who is, depends on the season. Um, now, the the gift wrappers in the mall, they're seasonal workers, so they're only working during the Christmas, and they don't work at, uh, they don't work once the season's over. And then for many of the migrant workers working in the farm to pick vegetables, pick uh, fruit, they're also seasonal workers. Um, you know what? Let's let's talk about this one thing. Um, if you guys ever watch Jeopardy. Um, I don't know if anybody here watched Jeopardy. Uh, you guys are probably too young for that. <laughs> but if you ever watch Jeopardy, um, the longest reigning champion on Jeopardy is a guy named uh, Ken Jennings. So Ken Jennings won over uh, won over two uh, hundred consecutive shows and won over two million dollars from the show. <coughs> <coughs> now this question I got it wrong, and it is is dealing with seasonal unemployment rate. 
or seasonal unemployment. So the question was that um, which major U.S. corporation hired more than half of the employee for less than six months of the year? So which major U.S. corporation hired more than half of the employees for less than six months of the year? Now, can Jenny put on Walmart? Uh, the answer wasn't Walmart. Uh, the answer was, um, you guys probably heard this before. Uh, it's, uh, let me give you some hint. Okay, so this company, it's a, it's a green company. So the color of the company is green. Um, the logo is a little square. So it's a green square company. Um, they don't sell anything. So they don't sell any good, but they do provide a service. So any idea what this company is? So we have them in Houston area. We have many of them in the Houston area. Any idea? All right. This company is called H and R Block. Okay. So H and R Block, uh, H and R Block uh, hire more than half employee for less than six months of the year. So that is called a seasonal unemployment. <laughs> All right. Let's keep going. Uh, unemployment insurance uh, is a government program that partially protect workers' income when they become unemployed. Um, now, for our current unemployment insurance, uh, it, it lasts for six months. So if you are unemployed, you can apply for this insurance and it will, cover, uh, it, it will give you um, a partial income for six months. So it wouldn't guarantee how much you were making before you're unemployed, but at least it's something to help with. Okay. Um, now, for this, um, for this unemployment insurance, if in order to qualify, uh, you have to be actively looking for a job. So in, in Texas, uh, the, the unemployment insurance is handled by the Texas Workforce Commission. So to qualify, you had to go onto their website to actively looking for a job while still collecting this, this benefit. And also to qualify for, for this benefit, uh, you have to be either laid off from work or if your company closed down. Now, if you're getting fired or if you quit your job, you do not qualify. So, and this is this, this how, how, how they will do it. So, so when you apply for the benefit, um, they will, the, the Texas Workforce Commission, they will do an investigation. So they will go to your company or you call the company and then ask them, you know, hey, um, you know, Mr. Manager, uh, why did, why is Mesha not working here anymore? And then if the manager says, oh, Mesha quit, or uh, if the manager says, oh, uh, she was fired, then you don't qualify, okay? So you're only qualified if you're either being laid off, that means if the company slows down, you are letting go, or uh, if company closed. So nothing uh, from your mistakes, okay? All right, so that's unemployment insurance. Let's, okay, so now what's a union? So union is a, it's a worker association that bargains with the employer over wage, benefit, and working condition. That's a union. Um, and I know that the, the, the most powerful tool for a union is something called a collective bargaining. So union members can act together as one unit and then bargain the, uh, all those conditions with the employer. And then strike, that's what unions do, okay? Okay, so also know what's the efficiency wage. Efficiency wage is any company who voluntarily pay above uh, equilibrium wage. So uh, if you guys heard uh, that Walmart is now paying their employees $10, 10 cents per hour, that is above the minimum wage. So Walmart doesn't have to do this um, because they can just keep paying the minimum wage. But the reason why Walmart is paying this efficiency wage is that at ten dollar ten cents per hour, even though they are paying more per hour for the for the workers, but in the long run, it's actually cheaper, because when you pay more for workers, you are retaining better employees who are more productive, and also reduce your employee turnover. So less people less less people working, uh, less people leaving the company, and then less people coming into the company. So reducing employee turnover, it also saves money on employee trainings. 
So you have better workers. You don't have to train them as often. Therefore, in the long run, you are saving money. And if you guys look at uh, look at the Walmart performance for the last year, uh, ever since Walmart increased the minimum wage in the company, Walmart has been doing much, much better. So this is the idea of efficiency wage. That sometimes when you pay just a little more compared to what it should be, then you can actually be better off for the company. Okay. All right, let me see if anything else. Okay, so that's it for this chapter. And then let's look at the next chapter. It's guard. All right, so number 16 is your uh, monetary system. Uh, oh, again, guys, my chapter number is different than yours, uh, but that's that's what you need to study for the second chapter for this week. Okay. Uh, so first, know what's a butter. Butter is any time um, that you are operating in the economy with no money. That's called butter. Um, so let me give you an example of this. We don't normally have this uh, type of economy, but sometimes it does happen. Um, the last time that it happened widespread, uh, it was in Soviet Russia in the late 1980s. Uh, in those years, the Soviet Russia was going down, the economy was very, very bad, and then many of the company they just don't have money. So there was a cement company, um, they want to uh, give a little holiday bonus for the employees, but the company didn't have any money. So the company went to the employee and says, you know, hey guys, uh, it's almost time for Christmas, we want to give you some, from, some, some present or some bonus. But we don't have money, so what do you want? Let us get it for you. And then naturally, you know, it's 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 Russia. It's winter time. It's really cold outside. Um, the employee says, "We want vodka." <laughs> so they want liquor. They want vodka. Um, so the cement company um, went to the vodka company. And says, "Hey, vodka company, um, we have some cement. Let's do a trade." We give you some cement and you give us some vodka, we call even. Um, and then the, the vodka company says, we don't need any cement, uh, but we do owe some money to the farmer. So go talk to the farmer. So the cement company went to the farmer and says, hey, farmer, uh, I know the cement, uh, the, I'm sorry, the vodka company owes you some money. Uh, let us give you some cement and you can, you can call even. And the farmer says, I don't need any cement, but I do owe some money to the uh, power company. Go talk to the power company. So um, the the cement company went to the power company, says, hey, I know the farmer owes you some money. Uh, why don't why don't we uh, give you some cement? We call even. And then uh, the power company allowed the, the cement company to build, to build a little um, a shack for them using using concrete. And then um, the power company forgave the debt from the farmer. The farmer forgave the debt from the uh, vodka company. And then the vodka company give the vodka to the cement company. So in the end, um, everybody's happy. Now, this worked, but it was very, very inefficient. So that's why we need money. So even though the so even though the money is not the most necessity for the economy, but money does make everything else flow. Okay. So we do need money. And then for for something to become money, it must satisfy three functions. So the first function for money, it must be a very good medium of exchange. So you can use money to buy something else. That's a good, very, very good medium change. And then second, money must be a very good unit of account. So you can use your money to measure the value of something else. So suppose we say that uh, one Big Mac is equivalent to um, half steak. So we can use Big Mac. As a, as a unit of account to measure the value of something else. Or you can say that um, we can use 1,000 Big Mac uh, to exchange for one computer. That's also meaning change. So money is, I mean, your Big Mac is good as a meaning change. Your Big Mac is also good as a unit account. But for the last one, that for anything to become money, it must also be a very good store of value. So for store of value, that means um, if you have money, Today, uh, the compared to the near future, the money should be in the equivalent value. 
So you wouldn't lose any value if you hold on to the money. Now imagine if you start still talking about Big Mac, so Big Mac we can change for something else. Big Mac can be used as a unit new account, but can Big Mac be a good store of value? So if you buy Big Mac, if you hold on to if you hold on to it for a year and a half, would would it still have the same value compared to before when you first bought it? Probably not. <laughs> it will expire, right? Well, the um, the veggies and the bonds will expire, but trust me that the meat patty would expire. Um, so guys, do this. Uh, go buy a Big Mac. Once you buy the Big Mac, don't even eat it. Throw away all the bonds. Throw away all the vegetables. Keep your the keep the meat patty um, somewhere in a cool area in your house. It will be good for at least six months. So give it a try. Let me know how it goes. Okay. All right, and we'll have two kind of money. We have commodity money and a fiat money. So commodity money is is any money by itself has an intrinsic value. So gold, silver, and then it says cigarette in the POW camp. They are all commodity monies. So by itself has value. And a fiat money is any money with no intrinsic value. So by itself is worthless. So so most of the paper currency in the economy they are all fiat money because by themselves they're worthless. They're not worth anything. And the money supply um, is all the money available in the economy. So for all the money available, we have we have two candidates. They are currencies, this money, and also demand deposit, that's money as well. So everything on your hand and everything in the bank, they're all money to the economy. And to measure our money supply, we have two measurements. So the first measurement is called M1. M1 is your currencies, your demand deposit. So demand deposit is like a checking account. So currency, checking account, uh, traveler check, and other checkbook deposit. Has anybody here seen a traveler check before? No, really, this is a this is a good measurement to see how old you are. Uh, if you've seen a traveler check before, you you are you are you're not young anymore. Okay, <laughs> you're not young anymore. So so traveler check was was pretty popular back in the old days. Now the reason why we had traveler check because for many travelers, uh, it's very inconvenient to bring cash with you. So if you bring cash with you when you travel, that's a lot of cash to carry. And then what what if you lose it? You lost everything. So it's not safe. It's also very inconvenient. And then some people people prefer to carry check, but the problem with check is that if you bring an out of town check, so suppose you know we we from Texas, and then we go to California. If you try to cash your check from Texas, it's not that easy. And some sometimes bank you won't even take it. So it's very inconvenient. Um. Therefore, that we have this traveler check. So traveler check was only offered by one company. Uh, it was the American Express company, and then you can what you can do, you can buy the traveler check from local banks, and then take the tra traveler check with you, and then anywhere you go, if you go to a bank, you can cash your traveler check, and then even if you lose it, call the company, they can replace one for you. So it's very very convenient. Okay. All right. So that's traveler check. Uh, now that's M1. So as of 2013, we have about 2.6 trillion dollars of M1, and then M2 is everything in M1 plus your small time deposit. So that's your uh, CDs, your uh, your saving account, and also money market money market mutual fund. All right. Uh, let me ask you guys another question. Um, do you guys know what does CD stand for? Now we're not talking about compact disc. We're not talking about the CD in the car. We're talking about the CD CDs in the bank. So for the CDs in the bank, what does it stand for? Anybody have an idea? Now again, this is a pretty good measurement to see how how old you are. Okay, so if you know what CD stand for, you're not young anymore. Um, so CD stand for a certificate of deposit. Uh, so it's very much like a saving account, but the difference is that for the saving account, you can get your money out anytime you want. For the CDs, you can only get your money out once the CD expires. 
Um, now, if you want to get your money out early, you're going to pay a penalty for it. And then most of the penalties, that means you're going to lose your interest on the CD. So uh, that's what CD is. Now, we don't we don't use CDs um, that much anymore. Um, it's just, just not that convenient. So nowadays, uh, we usually just do um, saving account or something called a money market mutual fund. All right, uh, does anybody have any questions right now? Well, um, some banks still have CDs, but consumer not to we tend not to buy them anymore. It just it's uh, the interest is not that high, and then plus you know all this constraining about whether or not you can use your CD earlier than early than expiration date. So that that's not really you know appetizing to the to the to the customers. So we just don't buy them anymore. But if you ask for it, some some bank might still have it. All right, um, so let's continue. Now, every economy has a central bank. So a central bank um, is an institution that oversees the banking system and regular money supply. Um, and then one function for central bank, the most important function for central banks is to conduct monetary policy. It's the setting of the money supply by policymakers in the central bank. So um, so central bankers, they regulate how much money we have in the economy and how much interest is in the economy. The central bank in the US is called the Federal Reserve. So Federal Reserve is the government agency that oversees our monetary policies. Uh, the structure for the Federal Reserve, we have uh, seven board of governors. They're, they're appointed by the president and then confirmed by US Congress. And then each board of governor uh, serve a 14-year term. Uh, and then we have 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks. The one that's serving uh, the Houston area is based in Dallas. Uh, guys, give me one second. Somebody's knocking on my door. Let's see who it is. All right, guys, I'm back. Um, so we have 12 regional banks. Um, now, again, the one that's overseeing the Houston area is located in Dallas. Um, and then there's also something called a Federal Open Market Committee. The Federal Open Market Committee is all your seven board of governors plus uh, five of the regional bank president. Their job is to decide on our monetary policies, so either to increase or decrease our uh, interest rate for the economy. So that's what they do. Um, by the way, the the, um, the the highest position in the Federal Reserve Bank is the the president for the Federal Reserve, for the chairperson for Federal Reserve. The chairperson is appointed by the president, uh, confirmed by U.S. Congress, and then the the chairperson serve a four uh, four year term. Now, uh, the last chairperson, his name was Ben Bernanke. Uh, he was he graduated from, from MIT, has a, has a PhD in economics. And then uh, before Ben Bernanke, it was uh, Alan Greenspan. So also had a PhD in economics. And then before Alan Greenspan was Paul Volcker. Uh, he also had a PhD in economics. So any idea what does this three, the last three chairperson have in common? Um, okay, you can. They all have PhD in economics, right? Uh, but let's um, let let me tell you the name one more time. Okay, so let's think about it. So we have Ben Bernanke, so Ben, uh, Alan Greenspan, Alan, Paul Volcker, so Paul. So any idea what does Ben, Alan, and Paul have in common? They're all guys, okay? So you gotta be a guy to be a president in the U.S. Uh, chairperson for the Federal Reserve. 
<laughs> um, and and really, if you guys check, uh, I'm pretty sure I'm around this one. Um, we never had a lady president. Says all there is oh, guys. It's, it's okay to say, um, guys are smarter than girls. It is. That's why it's called history, not history. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Um, the current, the current chairperson. Uh, her name. So is it her now? Her name is Janet Yellen. So for the first time in history, um, a lady is now in charge of our economy. Okay. So I mean, they can do everything. All right, and you never know. Maybe, maybe ten years from now, when you guys study in school, we don't call this history anymore. We call history. Okay. All right. So, and, uh, let's keep going. So, banks follows a fractional reserve banking system. That means only part of your reserve is um, lent out, and a, a, a part of uh, the other part is kept in the bank. So, um, we have this called reserve ratio. So reserve ratio is the percentage of your deposit that's currently held in the bank, and then um, again, what the other part is being loaned out in, in the economy. So every bank, depends on how big the bank is or how risky the bank is, um, they all require to have a minimum amount of money in the bank at any given time. Now, there are a couple of reasons why that is. One reason is to control the flow of money in the economy. And then the other reason why banks are required to have a minimum reserve is that for any consumer who trying to withdraw money, we, we know the money is there for you. So at least the banks are serving the purpose. OK? Um, now, if any of you guys study accounting, um, then um, this is called T-account. And on the T-account, you have asset on the left, liability and equity on the right. So for any bank, remember this, uh, your reserves, that's how much money you have in the bank, plus loans, they're all asset for the bank. Deposit is a liability. Now, the reason why deposit is a liability is because deposit, they're not the bank's money. They're our money, so they're going to give it back to us. So that's why your deposit is a liability. Okay. Uh, let me see. Let's Get this. All right, money multiplier. So money multiplier, it shows you the amount of money the banking system can generate with each dollar of reserve. Um, so suppose our, our required reserve ratio is 10%, and then the money multiplier equals to 1 divided by required reserve ratio. So 1 divided by 10% gives you 10, So which means a $100 deposit can turn into uh, $1,000 of money supply. So you take your um, you take your um, deposit times money multiplier, you find out how much money this deposit can generate. Okay. Uh, all right, just no definitions. What's the bank capital and what's the leverage? Okay. So bank capital is uh, the resource a bank obtains by issue equity to its owners. In other words, uh, bank capital is that in the bank, how much of the bank is owned and controlled by the owners of the bank. And leverage is the use of borrow fund to supplement existing fund for investment purpose. So um, now the banks, they're very smart people. What they do, they use your money to make profit and then give it back to you only a small portion of it. So they keep a bigger portion. That's how banks make money. So what else is required to talk about? It's a no what's an open market operation. Uh, open market operation is any time when the government when the Federal Reserve buy or sell government bond, that's called open market operation. Uh, when the when every time when the Federal Reserve buy US government bond that's giving money to us, so increase money supply. Every time when they sell U.S. government bond, that's decrease money supply, so taking money away from us. Okay, so that's open market operation. I know what's a discount rate. Um, discount rate is the interest rate bank charge on the Fed, uh, the Federal, Federal Reserve charge on the banks. So anytime when the bank try to borrow money from Federal Reserve, the interest on it is called the discount rate. Um, there is also one more called Federal Funds Rate. So federal funds rate 
is any time when the banks borrow money from each other, that's called a federal funds rate. So for any bank, then you're going to have this minimum requirement of reserve in the bank. And if any day you're short on reserve, you can either borrow from other banks, which means you're going to pay a federal funds rate, or you can borrow from Federal Reserve, which pay a federal discount rate. Okay. Um, there's one more definition. So run on the bank. Round the bank is anytime when consumer feel um, you know scared that we're feeling that our money is not saving the bank. We all go to the bank try to get the money out. That's called run on the bank. If you guys watch the movie, um, it's a wonderful life. There's a very good part of it that's talking about run the bank. So just go to YouTube, type in run on the bank. Uh, it's a wonderful life. You can watch a clip on you. It's a it's a fast long but pretty good. Okay. Um, now, guys, I know we almost run up to zero o'clock, so many of you guys have other classes or have to go back to work. Uh, and I do have other questions. So let's do this. Uh, is Rose here? Let's see, Rose is doing here, right? So, um, Rose, uh, I I know that you guys, some of you guys, need some help on the MindTap homeworks. Uh, so let me know which question you want me to go over, and what I would do, I will make some videos on YouTube, and then share the link on the uh, canvas. So, so in the chat box, uh, just let me know which question number you want me to go over, and I will I will make the video later today. Okay. All right, uh, does anybody have any questions at this point? Okay, yeah, that's even better. Yeah, you just email me the questions. I, I'll go over them. I'll make, I'll make some videos for you. Um, all right, so guys, anybody have any, any questions? All right, so if uh, guys, no questions, let's take a pause here. And then make sure to do this. Uh, check your discussion grade. Make sure you get your grade for it. And also check your extra points online to make sure you get your extra points for your uh, your exam too. Okay. Um, all right. So good luck, and I will see you guys same time next week. See you later. Bye bye.